Hey, Louise. Hi, Scott. How's it going? Oh, pretty good. How are you doing? Not bad. So you're just gone every weekend now until the end of the year? <laughs> now, yes. We will be here on New Year's Eve, but apparently we are gone every weekend starting next weekend through Christmas. Wow. <laughs> Lucky you. <laughs> it's going to be busy. Yeah. Did you say you were going to Hawaii? Yeah. That's one Good. of the, we were gone like Saturday to Saturday. Which uh, island are you going to? Uh, Maui. Oh, yeah. I've never been. Have you been to Hawaii? I was there right before the pandemic. Oh, nice. In Maui? In Maui, yeah. Oh, cool. Well, if you have recommendations, please let me know because we know nothing. Yeah, sure. Where did you stay? Um, oh, I forget. It was up in the northwest okay. area. Okay, we're staying on like the south side, I think. Something with a K. Yeah, I'll have to remember. They had really good airfares on southwest. Oh, Hello, good. Hey, Scott, how are you? I'm doing all right, how are you? Oh, I'm okay, no complaints. Uh, Councilwoman Sawyer still out sick, or is she going to be here tonight? I think she has a conflict tonight, so I'll okay. be here for her. Cool. Good enough. Hi, Brad. Good evening. Brad, are you or Annalise going to start off the presentation? I think Annalise is going to drive, and I'm here to kind of chip in and help answer questions. <laughs> cool. Uh, all right. Great. Oh, here's Annalise. Hey Scott, um, I'm also just going to PDF up the um, slide deck. We're going to go through half of it and the other half are just common questions that I probably won't go through, um, but I don't know, you know, your approach to distribution, but I'm assuming folks will want a copy of that. So I'll, I'll email that now over to you. Great. Thanks. All right, and Annalise, are you able to share or do you need to be host? I made you co host. She's incredibly still or yeah. frozen. She looks, she looks frozen. <laughs> Well, hopefully she gets that figured out. Okay. 
I'm going to go ahead and share. She has co-host status, at least in terms of if you look at the attendee list. So, yeah, so I made her I made her co-host and I think that should let her share her screen, but I'm not 100 percent sure. I'm sure that. Uh, yeah, her computer just crashed apparently. <laughs> Uh, she's back on her phone, it appears. Logging in right now. <laughs> Trying to at least. We'll see if I can get in on the nick of time. Um, but I've now had my computer crash three times um, in the past two days. So Ooh. it's unhappy with me. Mr. Weinig, I'm not surprised to see. Oh my you. gosh. <laughs> You've got to be sick of me by now. <laughs> no, I'm just getting used to you, Brad. Good to see everybody. It's good to be seen. Good to see you, Jim. Nice Hi, Paul. Good to see you. All right, it's just six o'clock now. Let's give it another minute uh, for people to join and also because Annalisa is trying to reboot her computer. I think I'm about 30 seconds from joining on Zoom um, properly. So see if we get okay. there. That should be fine because we'll give it another minute here and then I have a minute or two of introduction before we go to you guys. So. Thank you. All right, we're getting close here. Let's give it just a, another minute and then we'll get started. All right, 602, looks like we've got a good group going. So let's go ahead and get started. Thanks everyone for joining us for uh, the November meeting of the Near Southeast Steering Committee. Uh, got a bit to go through tonight, so let's go ahead and get started. Uh, as I sent out in the agenda, uh, first thing up will be a presentation from Annalise Hook and Brad Weinig about the Expanding Housing Affordability Program. Uh, we've got about half an hour budgeted for that, and then we will go over the draft vision statements and preliminary direction that we sent out. Uh, and then at the end, just a little discussion of what we're looking at for phase two of the community engagement. 
Um, so with that, uh, I will turn it over to Annalise uh, and Brad to talk about expanding housing affordability. Uh, Annalise, are you ready to go? Yeah, it uh, looks like, sorry, um, while we were trying to test, I do need privileges granted to me to share my screen. But while we're, we're sorting that out, for those of you I don't know, my name is Annalise Hoke. I work in community planning and development with some of your colleagues here, but more so on the regulatory implementation of how do we take our city's adopted plans and, and create them into policies that provide those sorts of outcomes. I'm also joined here by my colleague, Brad Weinig and host, and I'll let him introduce himself while we get our, our share screen going. So. Thanks, Annalise. Again, yeah, my name is Brad Weinig, Director of Catalytic Projects in the City and County's uh, Housing Stability Department, or host. Also live in uh, South Denver, District 6. I don't think I'm technically um, in the boundaries of the near Southeast area, but close enough to be familiar with the area and, and intrigued by um, kind of this whole process as a, as a resident. So I'm happy to be here, happy to, to, to share kind of what Annalise and I are working on and answer whatever questions you might have. Thanks, Brad. Um, we will get the slide deck out to you guys um, following the meeting here. So I know it, it might feel like a lot of content, um, but want to certainly make sure that we can move through stuff swiftly enough that there's a bit of time for question and follow up. So as many of you, you know, are, are well aware, Denver has seen considerable growth over the past 10 years. And, and a notable byproduct of that significant growth has been the fact that housing costs have risen at, at two times the rate of folks' income. And while it's it's been great for a lot of folks, not everyone has benefited. And what that means is that many of our kind of low and moderate wage workers and families have been um, forced to leave the city of Denver because they can no longer afford to live here. I think many of us know that housing affordability touches us in, in various different ways, but I think it's important to note a couple of different ways in which even if we aren't personally struggling with housing insecurity, it affects the, the community as a whole. We know that oftentimes lower income individuals and families are often deprived of housing that's located in, in great areas of our city with good access to jobs, transit, parks, and other amenities, and that really furthers the inequalities that we, we already have. Additionally, too, less money flows into the local economy. If I'm spending more of my income on my housing costs, that limits my ability to go to restaurants, to um, you know, go out to the museum, to do other things that help benefit our local economy. Additionally, we see a slowing of, of economic growth because employers can't find workers that can afford to live in our city. And lastly, we certainly know that, that that everyone loves traffic, right? No. Um, but traffic and carbon emissions certainly increase when folks are forced to live further away from their, their jobs, their kids' schools, their support networks, um, because the cost of housing is pushing them out. It's important to note that while housing seems to only get worse, the city of Denver has been doing a lot. And that's where this is really a joint partnership between CPD and the Department of Housing Stability. Um, since 2018, I'm not going to go through all these figures, but it's really important to note that over 23,000 affordable units have been created in the past couple of years. And we've touched almost 30,000 households through a variety of programs, whether that's temporary utility rental assistance, um, ADU um, kind of ownership programs through West Denver Renaissance, home efficiency repairs and upgrades, many of which allowing residents to stay in their existing home. It's also really important to note that, that housing is a complex um, challenge for our city, that there's a lot of different pieces of the puzzle that all need to work together. So what we're going to be talking a little bit more about is how do we fill in another piece of that puzzle? And so, you know, as we know that, that we need more affordable housing in our city, this is really about acknowledging that we need everyone, including the development industry, to really be a part of the solution so we can better meet the scale of need. And so that's what this project, Expanding Housing Affordability, is really about. Um, we are looking to create um, a new tool. Um, it's kind of called either mandatory or inclusionary housing. We use the term synonymously um, in this. But it's a tool that's used by over 900 communities across the United States, some of which have programs on the books since the early 70s. But essentially, it's to help us tap into that economic gain from new development to ensure that we're creating more affordable housing. So what that means is that as new housing development occurs in the city of Denver, um, it would mean that new affordable units are created as a part of that, resulting in what we commonly call mixed income housing. 
It's going to have a portion of affordable units that are going to be income restricted and ensure that they're affordable to teachers, nurses, construction workers, food service workers and families, as well as those market rate units that are, are gonna serve a higher or more moderate income. Some of you that have been around for a while, I'm sorry about some floating text going on, uh, my computer's having a day. Um, but it's important to note that, that Denver did previously have a program that looked a little bit similar to this. Um, it applied to large developments of 30 units or more of for sale development only. And what, over its kind of tenure of about 18 years, it did produce about 2000 units. So it was certainly a notable amount. However, due to state law limits, it really made it impossible for these standards to um, apply towards rental housing. And that kind of donut graphic that's being a little bit funky with the graphics there is really showing that the segment of rental housing compared to new ownership housing in the city is really kind of um, a, a notable difference. Fortunately, though, um, earlier this year, due to some great work at the state level and partners across the state, um, there were some changes to the state law um, that allow for Denver and other communities across the state to create a more holistic program that applies to all new development, not just those coming in for a rezoning, not just those asking for a special exemption, but all new development can now contribute to affordable housing. So in terms of what we're specifically proposing in Denver, it's important to note that while we're providing you with some numbers and things like that, it is certainly still a draft proposal and we're welcoming feedback and discussion. But essentially we're proposing that as new housing is built, new affordable housing is created. So that means that a portion of that housing that might previously have only been market rate or kind of higher um, is now some of those are going to be affordable units. So in terms of what we are currently proposing right now, um, there's a differentiation between kind of rental and ownership. I'll speak to the rental piece first. It's important to note that we're providing two different options in which the applicant could select to meet that affordability requirement. That first option is to provide 8% of their units to households that are learning less than kind of the term that we use commonly AMI, 60% AMI, or for a two-person household, that's about $50,000 a year. Those units serve teachers, food service workers, artists, construction workers, and firemen, if we're kind of thinking about who's accessing these units. Alternatively too, though, that they can choose to provide a greater proportion of units, but half of those are going to be at, at that standard kind of lower end of around $50,000 a year, and the other half of those units can serve households earning up to about $64,000 a year. So in terms of kind of what does that mean from an example development um, and, and how this might play out a little bit more, if we were to have a new 200 unit residential development come into play that's, that's building within your existing zoning allowances um, and it's outside of downtown, um, 16 of those units would need to be affordable and serve people like a preschool teacher, maybe a barber and their child or a, a senior folks that are on a fixed income. Other little caveat too that's important to note and why we're saying outside of downtown is that areas like downtown and Cherry Creek that are higher cost and kind of amenity rich, those ones have a slightly higher affordability contribution under that current proposal. The other piece that I noted is that this is not only applying to ownership but also rental, but we also acknowledge that the realm and the needs are a little bit different. And so the ownership requirements are going to look slightly different with a, with a higher percentage of units um, as those two options, but they're going to serve a slightly higher income level as those able to access and have savings for down payment and qualify for a mortgage are typically going to need to have just a little bit more money than those renters. So the, the first option that's provided on that ownership side is 10% of homes for households earning up to about $64,000 a year or alternatively a greater percentage at 15% of homes affordable to a mix of households going up to about $84,000. Another question though that we commonly get is, you know, what are some of the other options proposed? Um, it's important to note that the state law that was passed this earlier year wasn't just a free for all. You can, you can do whatever you want. It did have some caveats in it that we are being cognizant of in this proposal. One of those was saying that you must have at least one alternative to building those affordable units on site. The city's primary priority with this program and this goal is to ensure that as 
as new housing is developed, we're creating more affordable housing and getting mixed income housing. So we don't want neighborhoods that are only high cost and other neighborhoods that are only affordable. We want to mix that and integrate it and create more holistic communities. But secondarily to that, we also know that there's additional needs for funding. And so we are proposing a fee in lieu. That dollar amount varies based off of where in the city those units would have been required to be built and whether or not it's rental or ownership. It's important to note that these fee in lieu amounts are pretty notable and they're certainly intended to discourage this as the option, but it still is a legitimate option that some applicants may select. Alternatively too, we, we do want to allow for appropriate exceptions that get to our housing priorities and goals. And so while we don't want these to be the standard outcomes, there's certainly going to be instances in which it's appropriate for applicants to work with our Department of Housing Stability to create kind of an alternative affordable housing plan. Some of these things that they could look like with appropriate guardrails are getting to family-friendly housing and amenities, so providing larger units and appropriate amenities on site, but maybe a fewer um, amount of those units are being required. Alternatively, serving households with lower incomes than what's currently here provided, or land dedication. Um, uh, an applicant might have excess land that they don't need, um, but would be a great opportunity for the city to come in with our partners and provide a great affordable housing project with associated wraparound services, um, as well as concurrent offsite affordable housing in, in kind of the surrounding area. The other important piece to note is that while this is very much a mandatory program to create more inclusive communities, it's also important that we provide complementary incentives. Why we're doing this is we want to be promoting the creation of affordable housing as well as more housing overall. We know that supply solely isn't going to solve our housing needs, but we also want to add on that supply side as well as improving project feasibility. This is asking developers to be a part of the solution. And by providing affordable housing, it costs them dollars. So these incentives are not necessarily intended to make them whole or to ensure that their projects still hit those same returns, but to meet a little bit closer to the middle. So in terms of the incentives that we're proposing associated to this package are intended to be by right. So if you're building those affordable units on site and not paying the fee in lieu, the baseline incentives that the city is proposing to offer is a parking reduction down to 0.5 parking spaces per unit, as well as an associated permit fee reduction. Um, and those are kind of one time offsets. Additionally, though, there's an opportunity for us to leverage greater affordability in exchange for some additional incentives. And that's where, um, in exchange for a greater proportion of affordable units, we're proposing a parking exemption, some buy right height increases at a modest level, and in some instances, access to the affordable housing review team. It's also important to note that because we're wanting to discourage the payment of fee in lieu, if that option is selected, none of these incentives would be available to them. So in terms of, you know, um, wanted to kind of spend a little bit of time giving you enough of a foundation that we can have a productive conversation here, but I know you guys also have a packed agenda. So one, you know, if you want to learn more, our project website, we'll make sure that's in the chat, denvergov.org backslash affordability incentive does have a lot of great resources and the ability to kind of dig into this a little bit more. Also, if you feel like there are questions or information missing, we would love to know that so we can help better inform and explain this to the community. Also, we're here to listen to your questions and thoughts tonight, so please feel free to, to speak up. Um, additionally, you can also submit comments online. We are really prioritizing and trying to get to as many comments and ideas before the end of the year so we can improve this proposal and have a revised public review draft in early 2022. Um, so I'm going to stop here and just pause really quickly because it looks like someone popped up in the chat. Oh, thank you, Brad. Um, but certainly want to allow kind of the remaining 15 minutes we have for any questions, feedback, or clarification. And, and I'll just add, thanks, Annalise. We know this is a whole lot to digest. It's a lot for those who work in the industry and kind of live and breathe this stuff every day. And so it's, we recognize it's a big lift to kind of fully grasp all of this just as, a, as, a, as an engaged citizen of Denver. And so, you know, we, we recognize that there's no such thing as bad or dumb questions. We're happy to, to try to help understand however we can. Um, 
And uh, Scott, I don't know, do you want to facilitate the conversation there? What's the best approach for this? Yeah, sure. I can uh, call on folks. Jim, I saw you raised your hand there. Quick. Just a quick question. Uh, I was just curious, how many cities have programs like this in place around the country? Uh, so there's about 900 um, cities across the country that have some form of, of mandatory. So it's um, in some ways not innovative and brand new, but it is for Denver in the sense that state law has limited our ability to have these sorts of programs. Um, but it, it's very common, especially you know on the East Coast in California, they even have mandates in some instances to, for these types of programs. Okay, thank you. Uh, Lisa, it looked like you had your hand up next. Mute myself. I was wondering if this program is going to include any incentives to home ownership uh, via maybe a city and uh, county of Denver bond financing uh, program. Uh, I realize that mortgage rates are really quite low, but the big issue with home ownership, of course, is the down payment. And um, so um, finding ways to increase um, home ownership um, through um, bond-backed mortgage financing that um, has lesser um, uh, down payment requirements. Um, they might have um, uh, more of a restrictions that the person stays in the unit for a little while, maybe a 54321 prepayment penalty to make sure that that home, home ownership stays um, you know, for five years. So there is a stability there. But I think that that would be a nice add to this program. Thank you, Lisa. Great, great thought. Um, I, I will point you first and foremost also, HOST has a strategic plan that was just kind of adopted. It has a variety of programs and, and resources across the board. Um, we do have a couple of different down payment assistance programs, including one called Metro DPA that, that does effectively kind of what you are talking about and trying to kind of make that down payment affordable by baking it into the overall mortgage cost. And that's a kind of forgivable second mortgage over three years. It's been a very successful program. And it's not just limited to the city and county of Denver. It can actually be utilized kind of up and down um, the front range. I will put a link to that website in there as well. And, and then, you know, Lisa, great ideas. I'm happy to, you know, if you review it and have more questions, happy to try to answer them. At a, at a Thank you. Rate. Yeah, I just want to um, reinforce what Brad was just saying that this proposed program is one part of our broader affordability strategy that Brad just mentioned. So you know, this program itself isn't expected to address everything or solve affordable housing on its own. Uh, it's just one part of a larger strategy. Uh, Lise. Uh, this is, uh, uh, what I'm hearing is fantastic. I love the idea of the inclusionary model. Um, I did have a question as it relates to, um, are you also looking at possibly providing an incentive in uh, fast tracking? Uh, permitting uh, as also an opportunity. I know that I think Colorado Springs has an option like that. Um, I was just wondering if Denver is also entertaining that. Yeah, so that's where kind of that one block that was a little bit grayed out is the affordable housing review team. So this is a, a brand new team that the city got um, budget for about a week ago when that city budget was approved. So it'll come into effect in 2022. As we know, it takes a little bit of time. But that affordable housing review team is a series of new positions across all departments, not just CPD, but all departments that touch the development review process. And so their focus is going to be on being able to provide higher levels of customer service that really expedite those projects, reduce the number of review cycles, and really get those homes built faster and people housed faster. So that's an exciting kind of innovation um, that I know has been you know, a priority for CPD for a while, but given you know, budget cuts over the past few years hasn't been possible, but we're really excited to um, be able to expand that to a broader applicability beyond um, what was just a pilot project last year and only applied to four projects. Uh, Chris. Good evening. I have two questions. One, what's the timing of uh, adoption? <clears throat> and then two, on the deed and lieu, or ca cash in lieu, how is that changing your guys' contribution to projects? You know, as like a light tech projects coming forward, is that more availability to bigger, deeper affordability? Um, just wondering how that will work. Yeah, so um, your first question was around the, the timing. So the idea is that we're, we're we're targeting kind of the legislative approval process in the second quarter of next year. And what we've already been kind of marketing and advertising and discussing and signaling is a June 30th effective date by which 
if you are if you have a project underway, um, you need to have submitted your concept design to CPD, and then you have to have kind of been received final STP approval for that development um, by August of 2023, or in the case of a, a smaller single family or duplex development by December of 2022, in order to be kind of grandfathered under today's linkage fee rules and regs, all projects that don't meet that, that deadline will then be subject to the, to the new um, linkage fee and mandatory housing ordinances. Uh, to your second question, yes, the, the, the fee and new payments would, um, you know, we're, we're, we believe be utilized, and I say we believe because we're still ironing out these details, but the intent <clears throat> is to utilize them first and foremost to fund some of these incentives and then to use the rest of the dollars to support the creation of more deeply affordable units like low income housing task credit developments and other, other targeted programs, Chris. So, good question. All right, I saw Erica had in the chat the question about, uh, you know, are these percentages enough? I know, Brad, you already responded to that, but I don't know if you wanted to elaborate uh, on that. And I, I, see, I see Paul Cashman smiling because he uh, asks that question every day of us. But it's the, the the answer is yes, in theory they could, and 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 we and we want them to be as high as you know we can we can push. That said, if we if we overshoot right, then we're going to have a a, a a negative impact on the overall development market as a whole, and stymie not just the creation of affordable housing, but also market rate housing. So this has to be baked into financial feasibility. And we've spent a lot of time over the last year kind of analyzing that, talking with real estate industry folks, talking with other experts, lenders, et cetera, to try to get that right and, and push as far as we can go without kind of going over the cliff's edge, if you will. And, and just to kind of add a little bit color to that, I think too, inclusionary housing is a tool that really gets to that modest steady supply of affordable housing that kind of latches onto that trend in market rate. So if we think about you know, what Denver has produced in terms of the number of units over the past 10 years, it's in the thousands. You know, If we could have even captured 5% of that, we would have hundreds more affordable units. And so um, you know, I think the important piece to note too is that these are percentages, right? So 8% um, of zero is zero units, but 8% of 500, right, is a much more tangible number. So that's really where we're trying to balance it. And then also using incentives to say, hey, we'll give you a carrot if you give us more affordability and more market rate housing in those strategic locations of the city where we have said, yes, it's appropriate to direct more growth along those major transit corridors and around kind of our TOD areas as well. Um, so that's really where we're trying to find the balance. That being said, you know, many folks within the development community still feel like these are, are too high of an ask and, and have expressed concerns around it. Um, and, and, you know, we're hearing, you know, pieces on all sides of it, but we do feel confident that somewhere within this range um, that the development industry will be able to bear while still getting us much closer to our needs and our goals for Denver. Yeah, uh, go ahead, Erica. Um, how will people, and this might be kind of a side question in a bit, in a way, but um, how will people access these units? Will there be a website dedicated to this or how will they access these locations? This is important and I'll, I'll pivot it over to Brad, but I think, you know, some of you may be aware right now, different affordable housing projects all have their own different websites and they all have their different waiting lists. Um, what we're really trying to do through this is create a little bit of a more unified and centralized system in which people have easier and clearer access to it. But I'll let Brad speak a little bit to that is that will live in the Department of Housing Stability. Yeah, that's exactly right. It's it, There's a concurrent and related effort that, that HOST is undertaking currently called the um, prioritization policy effort which is really designed to, as, as we identify and create and preserve affordable <clears throat> income and for, or I'm sorry, rental and for sale units and homes, we want to make sure that, that, that folks who already live in Denver or, or who have been displaced from Denver or who are at risk of being displaced kind of have, have every chance and every opportunity to identify and, 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 and get into those units that they can afford and hopefully let them remain in, in their city, in their neighborhood, in their community. And so as part of that, we're also developing a, a, a much more broad database um, effort that's that's not underway yet. And it's going to be, you know, clunky as we as we roll it out. But the idea is exactly that, that there's kind of a one stop shop. All, all landlords with affordable units will need to kind of market and, and list their units on this site. 
and then we will have a good list of all in interested parties across the city who who are qualified for these who need a certain kind of rental kind of home ownership unit size bedrooms all those kinds of things and so it's 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 in the works but in the interim Annalise is right it's very much done on kind of a property by property basis they set up websites they post through other listings you know we help them out other statewide nonprofits help out as well um, we try to get the word out as much as we can um, to everyone who who might have a need for it and, and councilman um i did not so much speak to the linkage fee because i think in terms of kind of the community effect it's a little bit less and want to you know move through this content swiftly that being said though um, it's important to note that we're kind of proposing two concurrent tools. The linkage fee is something that we already do have in Denver, um, but we know is not kind of living up to its full potential. So right now when new construction is built, whether it's residential or commercial or office, they're paying a fee per square foot. That current fee is about 43 cents to $1.80, um, 86 cents dependent upon use. What we're proposing is an increase to those linkage fees. These are um, notably below what is legally justifiable and then slightly below what we've determined to be kind of financially viable. Um, but what you'll note here is that new kind of smaller scale developments um, would continue to pay a fee. And that's because once you get down to, you know, seven units, we're talking about kind of a half of a unit and so we can't have half of it income restricted. So um, it's pretty standard for cities to um, go to a fee structure or similar on these smaller ones. Um, through this policy, and I see a zero fell off on the screen, but um, smaller um, kind of more attainable housing types would pay a lower fee per square foot. Um, so, you know, um, if you're doing townhomes that are more modestly sized, it's gonna be a lower fee. And if it's a larger kind of mega mansion, you're gonna pay a higher fee per square foot. In the commercial sales um, services and repair, um, we're proposing an $8 fee per square foot in downtown and kind of all other areas of the city would be $6. And then industrial and manufacturing uses, those are currently proposed at $4 a square foot. And all of those funds, because their kind of justification for it is that that new jobs that they are kind of creating is, is inadvertently creating a demand for affordable housing. And so therefore, um, because it's creating the demand for affordable housing, we use those funds to go directly into the creation of new affordable housing. And that's a key component of, um, of one of the many funding uh, revenue sources that the Department of Housing and Stability uses to partner and create more housing. So thanks for highlighting that, Councilman. All right, we're about at 6.30 here. So if anyone has any uh, last minute questions here, Go ahead and ask them, otherwise uh, I think we'll move on. Anybody? We'll be sure that you guys get this slide deck um, passed through. Um, and, and once again, feel free to always reach out um, to Brad or myself before we log off. I'll be sure to um, provide our, our contact information there in the chat as well. But thanks for giving us a little bit of your um, packed agenda as you guys move forward on it. some exciting stuff, part of NPI. Thank you. And thanks for volunteering your time for this effort. We really appreciate it. And I'll stick around for a bit because I want to hear what else you guys are talking about. Uh, yeah, great. Thanks, Annalise and Brad. Really appreciate you coming in tonight and giving us this update. Um, so again, this is one of uh, the citywide projects that's going on outside of near South East. So we're always working on a broad, broad variety of things. Uh, and so you'll hear about some of these other projects as we go through this, uh, while folks come in and speak about what they're working on and what the impacts of that could be. Um, but we want you to be aware of this. Um, because, you know, as we've talked about, affordable housing is a big issue uh, citywide and in your Southeast. And so we want you all to be aware of uh, this one tool that we are currently pursuing, but uh, it is part of this broader strategy. Uh, so we will also need you know, more recommendations in the near Southeast plan to address uh, other aspects of affordable housing. All right, with that, let's... Uh, Get back to the presentation. All right, vision statements. Uh, so I sent all of the or sent all of you the draft vision statements on Friday. I hope you all had a chance to look at them. Uh, just a quick reminder of what the vision is intended to do. Um, it'll set the overall goal for the plan. Uh, that all of the recommendations need to support. So it provides that high level direction. 
uh, needs to be consistent with our citywide plans like conference plan 2040 and blueprint Denver. Uh, so we can't be deviating from our citywide goals. Um, it's about how do we apply that specifically to near Southeast and it's based on what we hear from the community. So last month we talked about what we had heard throughout the first phase of engagement uh, and your guidance helped uh, develop these vision statements uh, based on that input. Uh, so just a quick reminder, the comprehensive plan vision elements that again, these vision statements need to be consistent with, uh, equitable, affordable, and inclusive, strong and authentic neighborhoods, connected, safe, and accessible places, economically diverse and vibrant, environmentally resilient and healthy and active. And then our blueprint Denver vision is for an equitable city, a city of complete neighborhoods and networks and an evolving city. And also just wanted to remind you all again of this uh, commitment that how we plan our city can help us reduce our drain on resources and reduce Denver's carbon footprint to eliminate our collective contribution to climate change. Uh, and that has to be our overarching guide. Uh, so that, I uh, want to dive into the vision statements as we start talking about these. Uh, think about whether the vision statements capture the most important elements that we heard from the community. So what we discussed last week, are we capturing uh, the things that really rose to the top as most important? Uh, is there anything in these vision statements that you can't support? You read and say, that doesn't make sense. That doesn't, uh, that's not consistent with what we heard. Uh, that's not something I feel like uh, we can support. So we want to keep it on um, sort of the substantive things within these vision statements, if there's any minor errors, typos, uh, things like that, uh, to keep the conversation moving tonight, uh, just send those to us either by email or you can put them in the chat or something. Um, but instead of taking the time to talk those over, uh, let's keep moving. So with that, uh, first one is land use and build form. Uh, this is a big block of text, obviously. Um, doesn't make for a great presentation. And I don't really want to read this to you. Uh, hopefully, like I said, you've all uh, had a few days to look these over. So really this is just up here for uh, our discussion. Uh, so if anyone wants to start off with uh, any thoughts, questions, comments, suggestions on the land use in built form uh, vision statement. Jim. Scott, I read every word and uh, I thought it was right on the money. Great, that's good to hear. Well, if that's everyone's opinion, this will be a, a much quicker meeting than I was anticipating. <laughs> All right, come on, somebody has to have uh, something. There you go. Thank you, Lupe. Sure. Um, I, I think the only thing that I, I, I see here that I think everything is great. Uh, the one thing that I see is residents in every neighborhood can safely walk or roll. Uh, would it just best be served to say it can can navigate to community serving businesses? That way, it, you just you kind of cover it generically with one word as opposed to having to delineate at this point. Yeah. Good suggestion. Others, anyone else? Hey, Scott, just uh, kind of in that same vein where you say a uh, variety of houses, maybe just say variety of housing that reflect the collective design. That way in the future, you know, if any non-single family homes go up, you know, eclectic design is also considered in others, other forms of development. Uh, yeah. But again, that, but again, that's nitpicking. I, I think it's overall good. <laughs> Okay, good. Yeah, no, that's a good suggestion. Um, anyone else? Okay, let's see anyone. Uh, oh, here there's some comments. Uh, seems to be pretty feel good and desirable, Dustin says. Um, yeah, that's sort of the idea that they are um, 
you know, talking about an ideal version of near Southeast in the year 2040, right? If we're successful in this plan and implementing it, uh, this is what the ideal version of near Southeast will be in 20 years. Uh, so it is sort of supposed to be a, a feel good um, description. Uh, Scott asked about neighborhood nodes and activity centers. Um, you want to elaborate on that a bit more, Scott? Yes, sorry, my mouth was full. Um, <laughs> yeah, I remember in some of the other discussion about just um, desires for the area, kind of creating more of a um, sort of that um, walkable neighborhood um, kind of activity center um, that other neighborhoods have. I know an example that was floated was kind of like the South Pearl Street area as an example of what that could feel like. Um, I know that was something that came up in the, the public uh, input meeting. Yeah, um, you're absolutely right. And that's sort of what we were trying to get at with that sentence that Lupe commented on at the beginning that uh, folks can safely walk or roll or navigate to community serving businesses and amenities. Uh, we don't explicitly say that that's within these uh, neighborhood nodes, so we can clarify that because uh, that is what that's trying to get at. Okay. Yes, Scott, I, I, I would underscore that. The thing that, that popped into my mind uh, from our earlier discussions uh, was uh, the term cultural center, some sort of entertainment uh, type of venue. I, I know so, some of us old timers remembered the Rainbow Music Hall, but whether it's a, you know, a, a place for live theater or music or, you know, so, uh, so we don't have to go downtown to uh, exercise, uh, uh, you know, th that portion of, of our uh, uh, preferences. Yeah, um, you're absolutely right. That's definitely something we've heard. Uh, and we cover it a bit more in the housing and economy vision statement that we'll talk about next. Uh, but we can try to work that into this one more as well. Uh, Adrian. I, I overall think it's actually really good uh, to cover everything. And again, I, just for my uh, crazy preservation side of things, something about the history that we have here too. Um, I mean, usually mid-century modern speaks of the fact that we have the history for it, but uh, there's also new mid-century modern folks are trying to build as well. So something about uh, just our history that we're trying to keep in, in roots as well too, instead of just scraping and starting over as an homage. Yeah, good suggestion. Anyone else? Uh, so just reminder, questions, uh, do we capture the most important elements? Are we missing anything uh, from what we uh, heard from the community besides the stuff that's already been mentioned? Uh, or is there anything in there that you can't support that you read and say, oh, that doesn't make sense. Um, that shouldn't be the vision. Last call on uh, land use and build form here before we move on. Okay. Um, if you think of anything uh, later on as we go through the rest of these or even over the next week, uh, just let us know and we can uh, take that. We'll move on to uh, economy and housing. Uh, so again, I don't wanna read this all for you, but uh, hopefully you've taken the time to read it. So anyone have thoughts or questions? Um, you know, as we were just talking about with uh, Councilman Cashman, uh, it's this, was this the third sentence here? Uh, yeah. Opportunities for entertainment, cultural traditions and community events. We tried to capture that there. Yeah, I guess, and I did miss that, Scott. Thank you very much. Um, I, I guess I would have expected it under a heading more somehow relating to placemaking rather than economy. 
Yeah, and that's a fair point that um, we should probably try to work that into the land use and public forum vision as well, uh, since it is so important. Hey, Scott, only another small kind of nitpicky thing, but where it starts um, second to last sentence, residents of all ages can receive a quality education. I find it a little hard to say that we could, you know, guarantee they're gonna receive a quality education, maybe just have access to a quality education or. Yeah, that's a fair point. Uh, Adrian, did you have another comment or is your hand just still up from before? I'll take that as it's just stuck up. Um, Erica? Um, the kind of at the very top, the development of along Evans Avenue and other mixed use corridors has allowed longstanding small businesses to remain alongside new development and housing that has been constructed in the area. Um, it that kind of tells me that we're happy with the way Evans is working, which I feel like we've kind of all agreed that that is not how we feel. So that's how that that statement makes me feel. I'm not sure if anybody else agrees, but um, I don't know if it's just a matter of rewording it or if I'm reading it in the wrong way, but that's kind of how I feel about that. What do you think, Scott? Yeah, that certainly wasn't the intent. You know, as you said, that certainly we've gotten a clear message that we wanna see redevelopment along Evans. The idea was that we don't want to necessarily force out longstanding businesses that people like. Mm -hmm. uh, so we're trying to balance that of, yeah, we want new businesses, we want redevelopment, but we don't necessarily want to displace uh, existing successful businesses. Um, so maybe, maybe something about um, instead of has a lot has allowed, maybe we change that to say, um, we'll continue to allow but in addition, right. will be improved upon in some way. Yeah. Um, I don't know. That's just the way I read that. Uh, no, that's a good point because it's right. If, if that's the way folks are reading it, we need to mm -hmm. clarify it because that's not the intent. There. Right. Thank you. Uh, Lupe. Uh, just to, to kind of jump on the point, maybe the way to improve it is to indicate that the new development is uh, is fostering, you know, uh, uh, enhanced uh, street activation, you know, you know, fostering multimodal. I mean, just really giving it the spin that, not the spin, excuse me, really giving it the, the opportunity to indicate that all, although we're appreciative of certain small businesses, unfortunately, that also probably includes a lot of the storage facilities that are on Evans, which is kind of tough to swallow, but, but indicate that inevitably we're, we're, we're aiming for a goal where new development will tie in and, and with that new development will come these greater opportunities. Great. Yep, good suggestion, thanks. Uh, Councilman. Yeah, same, same topic, Scott. I, I, I think, I think in some way when we're talking about Evans Avenue, we, we need to say as if this is our vision for what Evans is in 2040, that it's been reborn. You know, we're not, Evans doesn't just need a few tweaks. Evans, you know, I, I agree a hundred percent about the, the language that talks about maintaining some of our older businesses along with making room for new businesses. But I, I mean, I really clearly heard uh, from this group that Evans needs to be redone. It's just not serving the, the community uh, the way it is now. So I, I'd like stronger language, please. Yeah, 
Okay, that's good feedback. We can strengthen that language. Um, Harvey asked about the Leedsdale corridor. Um, trying to remember, do we? I think we talk generally about yeah. So we say Evans Avenue and other mixed use corridors. So we don't call out Leedsdale specifically, um, but it is intended to be included in there. You know, we want to call out Evans specifically because that's the one we've heard the most about. Um, so we don't specifically mention uh, Leedsdale or Colorado as these other mixed use corridors, but that's sort of what we're referring to there. Um, so Harvey, I don't know if that satisfies you or if you want us to uh, talk. Uh, that's fine. Okay, great. Uh, Sarah made a comment about the fostering community. Uh, do you want to elaborate on that, Sarah? No, thank you. Okay. <laughs> All right. Um, yeah, and you know that's always one of the difficult things we can you know, talk about building design or building placement. That's the stuff that's easier for us to change or control. Uh, but that um, you know more subjective, more elusive community stuff. Uh, it's hard to address in a, a city plan. Uh, and there are, there are recommendations we can make, and we certainly want to look at those, but um, that will always be a challenge. Uh, Lupe, you have your hand up again. Yeah, um, uh, and this is a nitpick, and I and I apologize, uh, but the households of all incomes and sizes can comfortably afford safe and desirable housing. I'm, I'm wondering, what I do agree with in the, in, in the sentence is, is, is noting the displacement and, and, and the affordability aspect. You know, moving forward, uh, or wanting to to forego displacement. What I don't know is if that sentence um, is is something we can achieve just in our efforts. And so that's why I'm kind of questioning um, its inclusion into this. Yeah, um, I mean, <laughs> it is it is something we would like to achieve. I think you're right that it is very difficult and. Chances of us achieving it by 2040 are perhaps slim, but uh, this is supposed to be ambitious. Uh, well, although I, we don't want it so ambitious. I, it doesn't make sense. Yeah, I just, I just, there's an aspect of this which is uh, families of any size. I just don't know what that entails, right? Um, so I, I don't know if it's necessary. If that portion of it is is needed yeah. to be indicated. The the reason we included that is that we want to make sure that we have a variety of housing types and a variety of family types, right? We can, you know, one of the ways we could potentially achieve affordability is by building a whole bunch of cheap, relatively cheap studios, right? And then we can just force all the families out and we've achieved affordability. But that doesn't seem consistent with the goals that we've heard from the community, right? So we want to make sure that Families, okay. older folks, singles, um, you know, all different types of, of families, all different housing, family sizes can remain in the area and find housing. Uh, so maybe, maybe sizes isn't the right word for summarizing that idea. Maybe that's uh, something that we can improve. Okay. Um, right. Back to comments here. Uh, uh, all right, so Maria's comment, uh, it seems like we're aiming for creative place keeping an evolution of creative place making, which has led to gentrification. If this particular topic is inclusive of long-term businesses and newer things that the community has identified as needs once. Yeah, I think that's a, I like that creative placekeeping. 
That's a that's a good term. I might borrow that. Um, but I think that summarizes what we're trying to get at here. Um, yeah, and Erica says maybe call out lead style specifically. Um, uh, so Dustin, are you saying that should be part of vision that the corridor is less industrialized? Um, yeah, I think going to the councilman's point about some stronger language, if if we want to be more specific about it, I I mean, I'm not a city planner, but I, I see that area as relatively industrialized. It, it might be yeah. light industrial, but it certainly feels like this was a outer suburb 50, 60 years ago, so it was an appropriate place to house all that. But now as it's kind of a outer inner suburb of Denver, then having those kind of all the various services there might need to be pushed out in terms of, you know, just stronger language. So if we can identify what that, those business types are that are less than desirable, then uh, adjusting the wording accordingly. Yeah, that's a good suggestion. Um, and then it looks like the last comment in the chat right now is from Sarah that this seems like uh, unicorns and fairy dust, um, which, you know, as I, as I said, it is intended to be ambitious, but not so ambitious that it seems ridiculous. So if there's stuff in here that you think, uh, you know, that would be lovely if we could get it, but there's no way we're going to accomplish that by 2040. Um, that's a good comment. And we want to, we may want to, you know, scale that back somewhat into something that people will believe that this plan can accomplish over the next 20 years. Um, so I don't know, Sarah, or anyone else, if there's sort of specific uh, sections of this or sentences that you think are, are too ambitious or too unrealistic. Uh, I, I guess just to that point, you know, I, and I mentioned in the comments as well, I, I assume it's going to be very positive and very far reaching. It's kind of like you can't have a safety goal of it's acceptable that we will only kill 10 people a year at this business. Right. Uh, you know, imagine if that's what the army said, we're only going to kill a thousand soldiers a year. It's like, well, actually we don't want to kill any soldiers a year, but the fact of the matter is that may still happen. Yes. Right. That is a good point that we need to balance so the ambition with the reality and also sort of what we can say versus what um, is true, I guess. <laughs> we don't wanna be lying here, but we also um, don't wanna say certain things, I guess. I guess to the one thing that I think maybe we could add is to specifically call out housing um, I guess going back to what we just heard about incentives, and I think that could be explicitly called out in this. Um, yeah, and we, uh, yeah, we can think about how to work in more details in that. We do want to keep this sort of focused on outcomes as opposed to process or tools. Um, and so, you know, the, the goal with that program and the other housing programs is sort of this sense that we were talking about that households of all incomes and types or sizes or whatever we say um, can afford safe and desirable housing uh, and not worrying about displacement, right? So that's sort of the outcome we're trying to achieve with uh, the program Annalisa and Brad were talking about and these other things we're working on. Um, but we can uh, maybe make that a little more detailed about what that actually means. Uh, Lisa. I know we had a question about the sentence, the residents of all ages can receive a quality education and you know maybe a little wordsmithing, but um, I guess I don't really envision residents of all ages being able to, I mean, I don't think we ever, um, you know, discussed um, like a, uh, you know, uh, uh, 
college or or some kind of um, outpost of um, not a major university, but there there aren't a lot of um, educational opportunities without leaving our neighborhood for all ages. I mean, you know, quality schools would be a great thing, but I don't think residents of all ages um, could receive a quality education without having to leave their neighborhood. So I guess the words without having to leave their neighborhood um, to think that, you know, you're going to have some kind of resident academic program in this five mile area seems a little ambitious to me. Yeah, that's a, a good point. You're right. That, you know, certainly K-12 education mm -hmm. within the area we want to have, but some of the you know, university or older adult Job right. training or re-education. The job training part, I think, is you know, is good. Is right. but yeah. as far as an education without leaving their neighborhood of all ages, I, I think that's a stretch. Yeah, absolutely. But um, we're not likely to have those necessarily within the neighborhood. Mm -hmm. We just want to make sure that the people in the neighborhood can access them, even if they have to leave near Southeast to do it. I mean, just you know, to, to go to class or whatever. Not necessarily if they have to move out to the college side. <laughs> Uh, even switch it to quality work and job training without having to leave there. Yeah. Just scrap education, just quality work. Well, let's, I, I think one aspect of this is just to not forget that we do have community centers, you know, the Cook Park Rec Center, those, those offer opportunities and maybe we become a um, a catalyst for potentially having a, um, you know, additional hours allowed at, at our DPS schools, for instance, right, that would foster additional education for, as was mentioned here, you know, of all ages. Um, so uh, I, 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 I like the idea of having a community that that promotes this idea of a variety of education. Um, and, and I would encourage us, maybe it's just a little bit of the wordsmithing that is we, we keep the intent with, with maybe a little bit of management of the wordsmithing. Yeah. Yeah, that's, that's fair that we, you know, if there are opportunities to offer it within the neighborhood, that would be good. Um, but the bigger goal is to make sure that people have access to it, wherever that may be. Um, so yes, we will take a look at that and see if we can come up with a way that captures all of those ideas. Uh, all right, any more questions or comments on economy and housing? Again, just another reminder, um, taking sort of big picture, uh, do we capture everything important that we heard? Uh, and is there anything in there that you don't think belongs or that you can't support? All right, uh, then let's move on to mobility. So anyone have thoughts on this one? So I noticed the only mention of traffic reduction is really around not addressing the current infrastructure, like the roads. Um, does that need to be tossed in there somewhere? Or are we just going to say that traffic isn't gonna be impacted by actually addressing the roads. Um, yeah, that's one of those difficult things where we our citywide goals are, you know, our citywide policies are are not to generally not to expand right away, not to add lane miles. Um, yeah. But even just so, like I mean, Evans is atrocious in general. So, I mean, to use Evans as an example, I mean, the road itself is just filled with potholes, too narrow. I know, you know, lane expansion is kind of out of the question or whatever, but even just repaving. Yeah, <laughs> that's- I, I get, yeah. No, that's, that's a fair point that, you know, the quality of streets could be improved and that's something we should maybe address. Here. Yeah, I, I just know it's something I hear in our 
you know, our RNO all the time is, you know, traffic and here, you know, they're talking about the roads and everything, but here, you know, it, it mainly says we're going to mitigate traffic via, uh, sorry, I lost it. Um, it uh, via affordable, reliable, and frequent transit options. Yeah, right. So, and again, that's, yeah. that's, I mean, that's I would, I, I would, yeah. yeah. We're looking at you know, multimodal shifting folks to other modes rather than uh, necessarily making it easier to drive in the city. Yeah, yeah. I, I just see people reading this and immediately going, well, why aren't they fixing the roads or something like that? Yeah. So. No, that's but, a good point. Yeah, I, I, yeah, I understand it. You know, it has to mesh with the entire city and everything. So, just something I was reading came to my mind. Yep. Thank you. That's good. Uh, Judy. Hey there, Judy. If you're speaking, we can't hear you. Well, it looks like you're unmuted. Are you there, Judy? Uh, maybe we'll come back to Judy in a minute. Uh, Lupe, you want to go? Uh, yeah, the, the last sentence in the mobility, um, I'm wondering if we change the word walkable to activated, just because I, I think that's the activation is really what's going to hopefully, it, in the combination of the, the, the various mobility options that you're listing is, is probably the, the end goal. I know that you have vibrant, but I think um, this is where I'm putting my, my zoning hat on. I apologize, but just the activated side of things. I think that's that's the one element that I really want to make sure that that gets enforced and the reasoning behind you know the the multimodal aspects of of uh, having a plan. Right. Yeah, that's a good point. And we were we were talking with some folks from Dottie earlier today about this uh, this sentence in particular, and I think we're going to actually sort of break this one up. Because I think the goals for Evans and Leedsdale in Colorado are maybe slightly different. Um, that you know, Evans, we really want that activated community feel, uh, as we've been talking about. Whereas um, you know, Leedsdale may be more of a, a transit-centered street that you know, still allows access and, and um, has community-serving businesses and all that, but uh, it's less walkable and it's more not less walkable, but it's less focused on that activation sense and more around uh, being a transit corridor in Colorado it will still be you know, a major um, thoroughfare for vehicles with enhanced transit and, and better uh, crossings and things like that. But not, again, not necessarily creating that place that you wanna you know, have a, a sidewalk cafe along Colorado in the future. Um, so yeah, that's, I like that suggestion activated. Um, and like I said, we're, we're gonna be sort of reworking this sentence somewhat, I think. Uh, Judy, have you gotten your mic figured out? Can you hear me? Now you're back muted again. We can barely hear you. Um, okay, can you hear me now? Yeah, again, just barely. You're very quiet. Okay. Well, let me see if this works. Um, Quebec Street is a major arterial. Uh, it has a lot of traffic on it. That's not going to go away because it's the major connection between I-70 and the DTC. And there are no barriers like that. Aurora effectively cut off on Havana when they made Havana like they did up north. So in Denver, Quebec has become a major north-south arterial in the east side of the metropolitan area. It's not going to go away. And we've seen 
much more traffic on here now with the additional population that has come in in the last 10 years. So I think that's something we need to plan for. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, we don't mention Quebec in here specifically, uh, or Monaco, or some of the other major streets um, that are not necessarily these mixed use corridors like Colorado, Leedsdale, and Evans, um, but do carry a lot of traffic. Um, so yeah, we probably need something to address those as well. That's a good point. Uh, uh, Lisa. I, I just think it's very ambitious to say that injuries and traffic related fatalities have been eliminated. And I would just use the same uh, metric uh, as you have with the emissions and climate impacts that they've been, they're significantly fewer or something like that, because that's just not gonna happen. Yeah, yeah, this, this gets back to what Dustin was talking about, where you know, we have a, an adopted city goal to eliminate all <laughs> yeah. traffic deaths and serious injuries. So uh, it may not be realistic, uh, but it is one of those things that we sort of have to um, be consistent with our, our adopted citywide policies on things like this. So uh, yeah, I, you know, it's a really valid point that it may be overly ambitious, but I think that may be one that we're sort of stuck. Uh, maybe there's a way we can phrase it that's substantially not. eliminated or something like that yeah yeah we'll give it some thought if there's a way we can make it seem a little more realistic while still being consistent with our our goals uh, wasn't it isn't it an override city kind of the language yeah. is kind of what the city's adopted right. yes right that's our what we call vision zero which is to have zero uh, fatalities or serious injuries from traffic collisions, so. Um, uh, check the comments here. Uh, Sarah has a comment about crime not being mentioned. Uh, that is in quality of life. So we can come back to that if you think we've addressed it in quality of life infrastructure. Um, uh, Dustin's comment back on housing economy about independent local businesses. Uh, yeah, I think that's a fair point. I think we say something about that, but maybe we don't, maybe that didn't end up in there. Um, yeah, we can uh, make sure that is in there. Um, So it says quieter, how are people leaving? Uh, where does it say quieter? I think what we mean is that we are um, slowing down traffic on, yeah, so we're, we're shifting mode, shifting mode away from vehicles to other forms of transportation and I'm sorry. Uh, um, and then also trying to um, <clears throat> you know, reduce traffic within neighborhoods and slow down traffic within neighborhoods. Um, and that would probably need to address buses because if you're saying that transit options creating a healthy, quieter, and more resilient neighborhood, buses make some of the most noise ever. Yeah, that's a good point. Uh, yeah, that, that's fair. We will think about that. 
um, uh, oh, Harvey asked about the word activated. Uh, yeah, as Lupe says, it, it's sort of the same as pedestrian friendly. It's that um, there's sort of stuff on the street and people on the street so that you're uh, comfortable and interested walking along, that uh, the businesses have windows uh, and there's landscaping and there's uh, other amenities and stuff that um, it feels like a, a place people want to hang out. Um, and so there's, there's a whole bunch of stuff that goes into for making it activated. It's also sort of pedestrian friendly, walkable. Those are all sort of the same idea that it's uh, including the, the design elements and the activities and the, the businesses that make it uh, someplace where people want to spend time on foot. Um, yeah, so Erica, that's a good point that we do want to make sure that we're using terms that everyone understands. Uh, so we will we will think about that. Maybe maybe activated is not the best term if um, it comes across as sort of jargon, which it may be. Um, Yeah, and you know Sarah's last point here about the traffic and the growing population. It, um, we are trying to be careful to say that we are not going to solve congestion uh, because that is not something that this plan or any city plan at this point will do, and that's not our goal necessarily. We're trying to improve uh, mobility and accessibility so that you can get where you want to go uh, safely and conveniently, uh, whether that is by car or by transit or by foot or by bike or by some other mode. Um, and so, you know, I know folks want us to solve congestion and solve traffic, uh, but one, it's, not realistic, you know, we've been talking about realistic. That is um, one of the most unrealistic claims we could try to make if we were going to put that in here. And two, it is, as I mentioned earlier, not consistent with other citywide policies and goals. So uh, the focus, again, citywide in terms of mobility is about improving options um, and improving safety and improving accessibility and not necessarily uh, reducing traffic or reducing congestion. Uh, but the idea is that with uh, a better designed multimodal transportation system and better designed um, land use and built form that we can um, reduce the need for people to be in a car, right? That you can get to these other places uh, using other modes, either because they are now closer, right? That you have shops and businesses and whatever else uh, close enough that you don't need to get in your car or that we've improved, um, you know, transit service and bike paths and whatever that folks can uh, use that. And again, the, the intention is not to get rid of all cars, uh, nor our citywide goal is to uh, have about 50% of trips um, being taken by single occupancy vehicles. So that's still half of all trips folks will be taking in cars uh, as opposed to uh, these other modes, but we're not close to that now. It's something like 75 or 80%. Um, and so we're, that's where we're trying to, to shift those modes. Um, all right, uh, looks like uh, Lisa has her hand up again, is that right? So I, I really do find this statement to be the most visionary and um, um, in the sense that um, we're, we're talking about people's habits, right? You know, and how do we break the car habit? And I understand, you know, that we're not talking about process here and that the hope is by giving these alternatives that people will break the car habit. 
but I would like to like maybe include some kind of, of uh, I don't know if it's process, but you know, how are we going to implement a vision of people actually using their car less um, beyond just providing the amenity or the ability to do it, um, you know, does not seem to have garnered a whole lot of success here and in other big cities. So how do we get, how do we, how do we make getting in that car just less attractive? You know, and you know, a lot of times for me, it's like just making it slower and, um, you know, slowing down traffic, um, calming traffic, just not making it so convenient. Um, and I, you know, I know that we're trying as a city to, to, to try not to do big new road improvements and things like that, apart from I-70, of course, but uh, I'd like to think of a way that we could add to our vision statement ways that we can, I don't know if it's change behavior or what, what is it that we can do to change the behavior? It's my own behavior too, so I'm not critical. <laughs> yeah, no, that's, you know, that's the sixty-four thousand dollars question, right? If we, if we knew if exactly, we build, how to, that, um, if we build we it, they might they might not come. That's the, that's my thing, and and you know, and, and you know, this group, um, you know, we, we all seem like we're pretty active. So the statement, I think, what I'm worried about is that it reflects us, and it doesn't reflect the broader community. Yeah, it, well, it, you know, it reflects you know, our lifestyles in a way, because we created the statement. So that, that's my. Yeah, that, I mean, that, that is always something we're <laughs> trying to keep an eye on, right? That we are, um, we, we got all this input from the community, but we know there are lots of folks we didn't hear from. Uh, we tried to get a, a representative steering committee uh, but we know there are folks that you know aren't represented here, um, and so we are trying to always, you know, keep an eye on our biases. Um, yeah. You know, thinking back to uh, the great exercises Dante led us through a few months ago, keeping all that in mind. Um, so yeah, absolutely. But yeah, we need I, to... you know, I, I just just if some of my neighbors would just you know this would just not it's just N A not applicable. Right. This is not, this is, would not be a solution to them and this would not be a vision for them. Yeah. And they that, would like, they would like faster traffic and wider roads, so. Right, and then that, that's also then balancing mm -hmm. what some folks in the community want versus what our citywide direction is. Right. Mm -hmm. You know, we, there are some things that we just can't accommodate and, you know, there are, there are good reasons why these are citywide policies. And if those folks want to come talk to us, uh, I'm happy to have a conversation about them, why this is the direction we need to go. Um, but, you know, uh, yeah, unfortunately we can't make everyone happy on some of these issues. Some of these issues are uh, controversial or divisive. And um, while we want, uh, as much community support as possible. There are some things that maybe um, some folks will not be happy about in this planning process. So um, we're gonna have to cross that bridge when we come to it. Uh, Harvey, you had your hand up. Well, I'm just not happy. And yeah. I say that because that's what you said, to be people that aren't happy. So I'll, I'll giggle a little bit. Um, the one statement, and then you say it's a, the, the, the city statement, as a result, serious injuries and traffic related fatalities have been eliminated. And that's with that, what, uh, vision, Z, uh, vision Zero that's not really doing that at this point. Um, can, um, can you just, uh, can you say in there that, uh, that we um, support Vision Zero rather than going through this statement that's not, probably not quite accurate? Or would that just screw things up if you refer the, to a, a vision that may not be in place in 2040? 
Right. Yeah. And, you know, it's one of those things where not everybody knows what vision zero means. So we can say, you know, we've, we've achieved our vision zero goals or something, but then people have to, the other folks that aren't as involved would have to say, all right, what does that mean? So that's where we're trying to, trying to be clear about what we're saying. It sounds like maybe we're not. I, I think that. it's just, it's just a little, I, I, I think it's a little awkward, but yeah. That's just my, my statement, and, and, and you said people won't be happy, so here I am. And then the, the, the other thing, we're talking about getting cars off the streets and what we're going to do, but really, I think there's going to be, I my vision is that there is going to be alternate transportation out there that just hasn't been invented yet or even been used yet. And, and, and so I, I, I think we're focusing on cars and 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 buses, I think, is what we're doing. But it, it really, we want to focus on future alternatives that may come around and, and get us out of this mess. Yeah. Yeah, that, and that ties into what uh, Sarah just said in the comments about um, you know, other mobility options that we're not addressing here. So I think that's a good point that we need to have something in here about future options that may not exist yet or may not be popular or mainstream yet that could uh, become important things in the future. You know, the plans we wrote five years ago don't say anything about, you know, electric scooters that have popped up all over the city. Um, yeah, they you know, did. And, and we'll see how long those last, but, you know, that's something that uh, potentially could be, a you know, a, a, a popular mode of transportation years into the future that, um, you know, even fairly recent plans don't talk about at all. So good point on it. Uh, any more questions or comments, suggestions on mobility? Uh, oh no, it's hard. How your hand still up? Um, well, that's not good. <laughs> I will lower my hand. Thank you. Uh, all right. Uh, once again, big picture questions. Uh, we want to make sure we're thinking about um, are we capturing everything important? Is there anything in here that we can't support? All right, let's move on to uh, quality of life infrastructure. So this, again, is sort of a broad catch-all topic. Um, and I think Sarah had mentioned uh, earlier questions about uh, addressing crime and safety. And that is where uh, that should be covered in this topic. Um, so if you don't think it's addressed enough here, uh, let us know. But that's this is the, the vision statement that should address that. Yeah, Eric is thinking ambitiously about our uh, transportation needs. That's good. Um, are we going to have in, in kind of the, the, the development of this um, package? Uh, you know, the easily accessible. I love the idea of easily accessible. I just don't know what that means as it relates to, are, are we going to define that in the future? Um, yes. Okay, perfect. Um, yeah, you know, that was one of those things that we heard that the parks and trails are great, but some folks have trouble getting to them. Um, so we do have, you know, again, our citywide parks plan says everyone should be within a 10 minute walk of a park. Uh, so that's sort of our, our standard definition of, of easily accessible. Um, but that also needs to take into things like uh, you know, the safety of that walk, right? You may technically be within a 10 minute walk, but if you have to uh, you know, cross an unsafe street or something, that's still not easily accessible. So it will incorporate 
both sort of proximity and safety into that. Uh, Lisa. I'm not familiar enough with Goldsmith Gulch to, um, to know whether it is a mobility connection. I've, I've been on the area between like Evans and Bible Park. It's in kind of poor repair and, 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 there, and, and it's disconnected in a way, isn't it? Doesn't it go along um, Monaco and then it, so it moves? I'm just not familiar with it. So um, yeah, the, is it really a mobility connection or is it just a, a, a recreational amenity more? Right. I mean, at, at this point, it's not really either, at least in near <laughs> South East, it, it goes from Bible Park to the detention pond just south of the old Kmart, right? Uh -huh. but it doesn't really connect you to anywhere and it's not really long enough, you know, again, just within near Southeast to use as a great but it runs, it runs into Cook Park though, right? Right, yeah. And it, yeah. And it goes through Cook Park down to, um, to Hamden. Uh, right now there's not really a good crossing on Hamden, but eventually yeah. there should be. And then you can go further south down to... Um, so we're, envision we're envisioning it being a mobility connection. Yeah, exactly. That okay. By 2040, we're hoping yeah. that it will You'll actually connect it. to things. And I'm the, pretty uh, happy with it right now, but I won't argue if it gets extended. Yeah. <laughs> yeah I agree that, with friends right behind my house and we love it, but it would be great if it extended above ILIF because right now it stops at ILIF at the right. retention pond. Yeah. And it's and the in between Evans and um and yeah. um, it, it, it's in very it's in oh yeah poor repair. Poor repair. Yeah. Some so the, you know the long-term goal is to get it through that development there, you know, oh. as part of the Kmart redevelopment there dedicating land along Monaco for right. both drainage and eventually a trail connection. And then, you know, it jumps across Monaco and Evans. And it's just that sort of weird drainage there mm -hmm. for a little bit. And then it goes around the tennis club back under Monaco and then eventually out to uh, Cook Park. So someday it would be nice if we had a, that connection between Bible Park and Cook Park and Cherry Creek Trail. Um, so that's the goal for 2040. We'll figure out what exactly. I'd be happy with that. Or 2030, either or. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, sooner 2025. Is yeah. 2025. Yeah. That would be great. That is a. Um, I've ridden bikes with my family from our house, which is uh, along that that gulch, and crossing Evans with small children on bikes is really, you know, treacherous. So that would be great. Yeah. Well, good. Um, yeah, definitely that's something we want to tackle. Uh, Judy. Um, can you hear me? Yeah, again, you're still really quiet, but go ahead. Okay. Um, again, I really would like to see Quebec in there as major corridors like Evans Avenue. Um, Quebec. I think should be included as a major corridor within the area. Uh, yeah, right. So we are looking at that sentence sort of in the middle, major corridors like Evans, uh, the neighborhoods and parks and trails have landscaping and tree canopy that we should include Quebec in that as well. Thank you. Yep. Definitely. Um, all right, any other comments, suggestions on quality of life infrastructure here? Oh, a big comment. Uh, Yeah, um, Sarah, that's a good point. Again, we you know we're focusing 
sort of on outcomes. So the idea is that we want these, you know, safe and inclusive neighborhoods. And that may be uh, an important tool for accomplishing that. And so maybe we want to work something in about, um, you know, the sort of community-based safety uh, idea, that that's important. Uh, any other comments on quality of life? Uh, so Councilman Cashman notes that the neighborhood watch is increasingly active in the district. So yeah, that's something we can look at. Um, and then trolley car idea on Leedsdale. Um, yeah, I think that was uttered at some point. Generally, it's not necessarily uh, excluded, but generally what we're looking at is more uh, BRT on corridors like Leedsdale and Evans and Colorado. Um, it's generally more cost effective, um, but it doesn't, again, doesn't necessarily mean that's, uh, I, I, would, I was just re responding to Erica's uh, um, suggestion about yeah. a, a hop off, hop on trolley system. And I just remembered that maybe 10 or 15 yep. years ago that, that is, an idea like that was floated for Leedsdale. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Council. Uh, yeah, they, uh, it's not so far fetched as it might seem. We, I believe we we're, we're, have begun or will shortly begin uh, some form of, I think it's RTD-based circulator service out in the Montbello Green Valley Ranch area. So I, I, I think we should keep that idea alive as we move forward. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. The idea of a, a circulator um, or some you know, thing like that uh, is absolutely something we can look at. Um, it will be, you know, like the one in, in Montbello is a, a bus uh, type thing instead of a, a you know, rail-based system. Uh, but again, that, those are the kinds of details we don't necessarily need to be thinking about at this point. So um, the point's a good one about the uh, circulators and, and better transit connections. Um, all right. Anything else on quality of life infrastructure? Last time, for these questions. Okay. Um, so great comments and discussion on all, on all of this. We will take all of that and revise these vision statements uh, and share them with you again uh, for our December meeting. Um, with the idea that hopefully we can get endorsement with the, these vision statements from the steering committee in December uh, so that when we go into phase two of engagement in uh, early 2022, we can share these with the public and try to get um, their buy-in on these vision statements as well. All right, so moving on to uh, what we're calling preliminary direction uh, which is kind of a clunky term. So if anyone has a better idea, we're open to it. Uh, but that's what we're using for now. Uh, the idea here is that we are taking sort of all of the feedback we got from the community, trying to sort of summarize it uh, in a way that provides guidance for going into the next round of community engagement. So uh, the goal, the big goal coming out of phase two of community engagement will be developing draft recommendations. Uh, so what we want here is covering all of, or most of the topics that the plan will cover. Uh, what is the general direction that we're hearing from the community coming out of phase one? So this will help us craft the questions 
uh, that we'll be asking the community in phase two uh, so that we can build on those and come up with these specific recommendations. So that's sort of the idea here. Uh, the document we sent out uh, had some background information, both existing conditions and some highlights from the uh, community direction. Um, and then uh, listed these um, preliminary direction bullets by subtopic. Uh, so we've got a little over 20 minutes left. Uh, so we'll try to move through this quickly. Um, and then if there are more comments or suggestions that we can't get to tonight, uh, you can again, send those to us uh, after the meeting. Um, but big picture questions, anything missing? Is there anything you can't support? Um, so again, I don't want to read these to you. Uh, and we have, you know, there are like eight subtopics for land use and build form. Um, so maybe I'll just walk through those really quickly. Uh, so first is uh, for development along major corridors uh, like Evans, Colorado, Leedsdale. Uh, the second subtopic is design in mixed use and commercial areas. And then uh, design in residential areas, including uh, preservation. Uh, height and density, mostly focused in this area on, or in this subtopic on, uh, again, the mixed use and commercial areas. And then sort of density and incorporating missing middle housing into the residential areas. Uh, the local centers, uh, so the small sort of neighborhood nodes uh, that we'd like to see more of. Uh, and then the larger centers, uh, mostly around those transit stations at Colorado and Yale, the transit oriented development. Uh, and then the more uh, sort of nebulous community idea um, of how we can uh, support that or further develop that. So yeah, those are just sort of the subtopics that we've grouped these into uh, as an idea of how we can organize these comments uh, and eventual uh, recommendations. Uh, but these aren't set in stone, so things could be moved around or, or subtopics could be added or deleted. Um, but uh, again, hopefully you've had a chance to read through these. Anything anyone notice that they expected to see here and didn't see anything that they can't agree with, any other thoughts on land use and built form? Uh, sorry. Scrolling the wrong thing. Uh, Councilman, you have your hand up. Is that just from before? No, it went down. Okay. All right. I'm not seeing anything in the comments. No one's raising their hand. Everybody likes everything, or you haven't had a chance to read through it, or it doesn't make any sense and you don't know where to start. Yeah. I've scrolled and it looks pretty good. I'm happy to see dog parks mentioned. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Thanks, Spencer. Uh, Jim, go ahead. Scott, you know, uh, I, I went through every word of every document, and, uh, you know, if you get a lack of response on something, don't worry about it. You did a great job. It's very thorough. It's very detailed. You know, there was nothing alarming uh, for any of us to comment on. So I think our silence speaks volumes to the word that uh, the work that you've done. Thank you. That's great. Thanks, Jim. It's one of those things where you're worried. It's either right. It's either good or it's so bad nobody knows what to say about it. Um, so I just want to make sure we're not on the, the wrong side of that. Hey, Scott, how does the, I'm oh, sorry, go ahead. No, 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 you're up, Spencer. I, I was just going to ask, how does the city to define protected bike lanes, just for my own knowledge? Um, so protected bike lanes have some kind of separation from traffic that can be curbs or bollards or mm -hmm. a parking lane between the bike lane okay. and the, the through traffic. Uh, okay, I just I, I just wanted to know when I'm riding around, like what I should be looking for, if anything. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Cool. So we you. You know, we sort of have a spectrum of bicycle 
facilities um, from sort of neighborhood bikeways that don't necessarily have lane markings to you know, unprotected bike lanes to protected bike lanes to off street facilities like the, the trails. Uh, so protected bike lanes are sort of the highest level on the street um, bike facility. Thank you. Yep. Councilman, did you have? Yes, yeah, Scott, I was just I was just wondering when you uh, think you'll have uh, the edits to what we're talking about tonight incorporated and uh, sent out to us. Uh, yeah, we'll definitely send it out before the uh, before the December eighth meeting. That's our next meeting is December eighth. Uh, so, uh, you know, we're hoping to get these changes made in the next week or two. Um, if folks want more time to spend with it, we can try to get the the revised versions out earlier. Uh, if you know the Friday before still works for everyone, we can just. Do that. I think that you know, obviously, it's a big job. As early as you can would be helpful. I know for me, this discussion has really helped uh, me focus uh, uh, more intently on, you know, the the words and what may be missing or. You know, if if there's anything that perhaps we can uh, jettison along the way. Yeah, definitely. All right. Um, so we will aim to get these out before Thanksgiving, then, uh, to give folks plenty of time to review it before the December eighth meeting. How does that sound? Great. Um, all right. Any more on the preliminary direction for land use and built form? All right, then let's move on. Um, I was gonna have Libby talk about this, but I think in the interest of time, maybe I'll just cover it. Um, so again, uh, just running through the topics here for housing and economy. Uh, so the first one is um, housing affordability and options. Um, the second is housing quality, making sure that house, housing uh, moves up to standards, uh, then development and revitalization uh, of commercial areas, uh, providing jobs and addressing uh, those experiencing homelessness, uh, and then uh, sort of the specific businesses and um, the shopping areas uh, that go with that, and then education. Yeah, education is the last one. Um, so any thoughts on uh, housing and economy? Dog parks, folks like dog parks, yeah. Lisa. I think this is where we had a more, uh, you know, kind of a, a schizoid uh, response from the community. Um, because we had a lot, as I remember the discussion about here is, you know, we have this residence like the quality, quiet and friendly neighborhood with, you know, single family homes and large lots. And then our preliminary direction, you know, starts, you know, by saying that, you know, we want more affordable rental and ownership opportunities. And, and you know, that's not consistent with houses on large lots. Um, um, so, I'm trying to wrap my head around, um, you know, I, like I said, I remember the discussion we had on it was last uh, meeting or the meeting before uh, about um, how how there was a mixed message in the in the surveys that we got back. Yeah, um, you're right. There, you know, we got <laughs> a variety of responses along that. Um, some wanted. You know, a lot more housing options. Some wanted no change at all. Uh, so we've sort of tried to split the difference while also, again, being consistent with our citywide direction, which is that every neighborhood needs to uh, incorporate more housing options to help meet our affordability goals. Um, so we want to, you know, as much as possible, preserve what folks like about the neighborhoods because uh, we know that um, there are a lot of things that people like about their neighborhoods. 
uh, but we also do need to find ways to uh, work more housing options and more affordability into every neighborhood. So uh, yeah, that's what we're trying to accomplish here. Anything else on housing and economy? Okay, uh, moving on to mobility. This one's sort of the most straightforward way that we've organized things. Uh, pedestrian uh, topics, bikes, transit, and vehicles. Um, and you know, as we were talking about earlier, we probably need more thinking about things that don't necessarily fall into one of those four categories right now, um, potential future options. Um, but other than that, is there anything folks noticed missing or anything you disagree with? Can you put the vehicular slide up again for a second? Yep. Thank you. I notice, uh, you know, again, we call out Colorado, Leedsdale, and Evans specifically. Um, but, you know, we've heard from Judy tonight that we need to also be thinking about Quebec and the other uh, major corridors. Um, yeah. So we'll add that. Right. Um, any thoughts on that? Uh, all right. Then moving on finally to quality of life infrastructure. Uh, so here we have parks, trails, uh, landscaping throughout the area, uh, stormwater and green infrastructure. Uh, resources. So this is looking at through our water supply and energy use and things like that. Uh, safety. Uh, so getting back to what Sarah was talking about, um, dealing with crime and things like that. Uh, and then access to health care and health, healthy living and food, um, both restaurants and um, fresh food. So any thoughts or suggestions on quality of life infrastructure? Uh, the role of RTD in the transit piece. Yeah, um, you know, RTD is a partner that we work with. Um, and that's sort of a bigger question that, you know, you may be familiar with our citywide transit plan that removes transit uh, that calls for a whole bunch of improvements to the transit system in Denver. And we are uh, still in the process of figuring out how that will work with RTD, whether that is, um, you know, adding to the service provided by RTD or supplementing that or some other option. So, um, it's a good question that we don't yet have a definitive answer for on uh, meeting our ambitious transit goals um, for the city. All right, there's no... Uh, I, have a, I have a quick question. It's a, it's a real in the weeds question and I apologize now for everybody else on this call. Um, there is this uh, under landscaping, more trees in the area to reduce heat and mitigate sound um, and air pollution. Um, totally agree with it, love it. Uh, the one thing that I've come across as of late is that uh, acoustical engineers can't use landscaping in their calculations as a, as a means of mitigating sound. So that one is just a tough one for to, to kind of swallow. I totally agree with you. It, 
increasing landscaping, it would be an amazing feat. Um, and it, but I just don't know whether or not there's a um, actual uh, means that we can encourage a calculable means of, of you know how, do, how does one go about calculating that mitigation? Yeah. Um, I don't know. That's a fair point. <laughs> uh, yeah, because it, you know, it, it helps. We know it helps, but yeah, if we can't me accurately measure it, we'll need to figure out the best way to implement it. I just, I just don't know whether or not, it, you know, um, I would love to see this, the overall city kind of utilize landscape and say, you know, even though it may not be an actual perceivable decibel level, but just the idea of in, in allowing for as an incentive, yeah. as that as an option, um, it would be fantastic. And I just, I would love to see that, you know, if we can allow that to become something that is populated throughout the city, that'd be great. Yeah. Yeah. So is that a, a city regulation? Do you know that, that we can't count that or is that? It's, it's, it's in the engineers, acoustical engineers, unfortunately, are unable to calculate a reduction of decibel levels based on a, uh, a the porousness of a material. It has to be solid in order for yeah. it to be counted within their, their calculations. And so the only result of this is that, uh, is, especially with HUD designs, um, is that you have to either risk the idea of going out there, creating this amazing landscape, uh, and, and then be forced to put in a stupid fence after the fact, right. you know, because you can't get down two decibel levels. So, okay. Um, that's a good thing to think about. Thanks. Uh, Lisa. Um, the improving access to healthcare, I think, is pretty vague and I, something that is so, seems to be to be out of the scope of things that we could do as a neighborhood plan because. Um, you know, either the city or the state, you know, uh, uh, you know, the access to health care is just is a national problem and an embarrassment and a crime. And um, so I, I, I don't know if I don't know exactly what you mean to improve access to health care, but it just seems that it's not consistent with a neighborhood group plan. Yeah. Yeah, certainly. You know, there are statewide and nationwide issues with access, but I think there are also local issues that we can look at. Some of them you know, sort of explicitly on the access side, that if there's, uh, you know, people have trouble getting to doctor's offices, getting to hospitals and clinics, uh, we can maybe address that, you know, all the mobility stuff we've been talking about. and. Uh, other things. So that's, I think not, that's, that's not how I took it. And I yeah. didn't take it. I didn't take it like, oh, it's easier to drive to the dentist's office. I right. took it that you actually are improving access to, you know, just like part of the, the city's vision is to improve um, access to affordable housing. Right. But I hate to say it, I don't believe that we have a city initiative to improve access to health care or a state initiative at this present time and certainly not a national one. Yeah. Yeah, that's a, a good point. Maybe we need to look at how well, we're phrasing that so it's clear what we mm -hmm. are trying to address. Uh, that's a good discussion. All right. Um, that let's move on since we have four minutes left. I will quickly run through uh, this phase two engagement stuff. Um, but thank you all again for your comments and discussion on that. Um, and if you think of anything else over the next week or so, uh, send it to us uh, and we will incorporate that into uh, the revised version of this. Uh, so phase two, um, as I mentioned, uh, the big goal is to develop the recommendations for the identified issues and opportunities. Uh, also, as I mentioned, we want to confirm the vision statements that we are working on drafting. Um, for some of the big topics, for some of the what we're calling key issues, instead of going straight to a recommendation, 
Uh, we will likely be developing alternatives. So there are different ways we could try to tackle some of these big issues. Um, and so we will, as part of phase two, develop different alternatives that we could pursue. Uh, and then as part of phase three, we will work with the community to select the preferred alternative um, from that. And that will go into the plan. Uh, we also have what we call focus areas and transformative projects. Uh, so focus areas are, are locations within near Southeast that we know need special attention. So Evans is the obvious one at this point, uh, but there may be others that we identify that we want to have some more specific recommendations and a little more time thinking about. Uh, and then transformative projects are uh, ideas for improving the area. Uh, they may be tied to these focus areas, they may not, but it may be like, uh, you know, we we're just talking about Goldsmith Gulch. So maybe uh, a transformative project is, you know, connecting Goldsmith Gulch from uh, Evans up to Cook Park, um, something like that. So start to identify and develop those. Um, also within the plan, each neighborhood will have its own section. So we want to start getting into some of these neighborhood specific issues that uh, these neighborhood sections will address. So, so far we've been talking uh, pretty high level, pretty area wide goals and uh, yeah. ideas. But we want to start talking about, all right, what is Goldsmith need versus Indian Creek versus uh, Washington, Virginia Vale, uh, dive into those specific issues. And then throughout all of this, we want to be clear about uh, sort of the narrative of the process, right? So clear about what we did in phase one, how we took that input, what we've done with it, how that led to what we're now doing in phase two, uh, and then how what we're doing in phase two will inform phase three and the rest of the process. So making sure that everyone understands where we are in the process, what we've done, how that has informed what we're doing now and how it will inform what we're doing next. Um, so to do that, uh, we'll use a variety of tools like we've done in the past. So we're gonna have an online survey again, uh, or may break, break it up into a few smaller surveys. We're still figuring that out. Uh, we'll have a virtual community workshop again. Uh, or we may do a few smaller meetings um, by neighborhood or some other division. Uh, again, we're still working that out. We're gonna do focus groups. So we'll invite uh, people who have a, an interest or expertise in certain topics into focus groups to do sort of a deep dive into those and help us develop these recommendations. Uh, we also now finally have our uh, consultants fully on board. Uh, and so they will be developing the community navigators program. So we'll be starting to identify uh, and recruit those community navigators and using them uh, throughout phase two and the rest of the process. Uh, focused engagement, as we talked about last month when we showed you the results of who we've heard from, we know there are gaps still in who we're hearing from and who we're engaging with. So we'll develop a plan to try to fill those gaps and work on that. And then again, going out to existing community events and meetings um, to help raise awareness. So that is uh, what we're planning to do. Again, as I mentioned, uh, we're looking at early 22, hopefully January, early January to launch this um, workshop or workshops in early to mid January. The survey open uh, from a little before those workshops uh, into February at least. Uh, and we'll probably do another six to eight weeks of um, community engagement uh, and those. So all those other things, the focus groups, navigators, all that will happen. Uh, during that time frame when the survey is open. Uh, so I know we're at eight o'clock now. If folks need to leave, uh, go ahead. If anyone has any questions or uh, comments on this, uh, you can go ahead and share those as well. Harvey. Yeah, uh, last meeting you talked or you put a message out there as far as taking tours of neighborhoods or walking tours of neighborhoods. Is that a part of the, the next phase or how is that? how would that fit in or has that been abandoned? Uh, yeah, so as part of the community engagement, we're thinking probably in phase three, we will try to do some walking tours. Um, both that will give us, an, at that point, we will have uh, you know, draft recommendations or alternatives that we will be looking at. And so we can go out to specific locations and, and talk about them in detail about uh, these are the suggestions or the recommendations we have to address this and, and look at that. And also that will uh, be better uh, weather-wise that will get us into the spring at least. Um, 
And so that's when we're looking at doing uh, the public walking tours. Uh, we also talked about doing a, a walking tour for all of you. Uh, and that we are looking at scheduling uh, in the next month or two. I'm gonna send out a doodle poll uh, shortly to all of you um, to try to find a Saturday that you all would be interested in joining us in a walking tour. Um, and then that'll be weather dependent. If the weather gets really bad, we will uh, rain check and reschedule um, if we're trying to do it here this winter. Yeah, that's, that's the walking tour I was talking about is for the group and having fairly quickly. Yeah. So we can see what each other group is talking about and what the neighbors look like, neighborhoods actually look like. Yep, absolutely. Yeah. So as I said, I will be sending out a, a doodle poll to try to find a date for that uh, here shortly. So look for that. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for bringing that up. That was something I meant to mention. So thanks for reminding me. Um, any other thoughts or questions on uh, phase two engagement? We are uh, I'm further developing this. So you'll, we'll have more information next month about what uh, the details will be and we'll share all that with you. But I want to give you sort of an update on uh, the goals and what we're generally thinking for um, how we're gonna tackle it. Uh, I ended up at the top of the comments. Uh, all right, no one has anything, uh, then we will call it a night. Thanks again, everyone. This was really uh, productive. I feel like uh, really appreciate everyone's uh, thoughtful comments on these things. So uh, I hope you all found it uh, fruitful as well. Uh, if you have any more comments, send them to us um, and we will get these revised documents out to you in the next couple of weeks. Uh, with that, everyone have a, a good rest of your evening and uh, a good Veterans Day tomorrow for those of you who have it off or are otherwise observing uh, Veterans Day. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks, everyone.